Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may find yourself. My name is Will Del Pilar. I'm the Vice President of Higher Education at the Education Trust in Washington, D.C. And I'm honored to be joining you today. Um, I know you guys just uh, saw a, an amazing panel with, uh, with Sarah goldrick Uh And we're excited to continue the conversation on the idea of inclusivity and rigor in the classroom. Um, I'm honored to, to, um, to be joined by a very distinguished panel. Um, and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, the organization they're with, and why this topic is important. And we'll start with uh, President uh, Bastin. Certainly good to be with you today, Will, and to all of my wonderful colleagues. As was mentioned, my name is Michael Bastin. I'm the president of Rockland Community College. And of course, all of our students, all of our learners everywhere need to feel a part of their experience. And we need to make sure that they have the opportunity to live the lives that they deserve. So I'm so excited to be with you today. Dr. Hamilton. Hi, Will, and hi, everyone. It's, a, it's an honor to be part of this panel. I'm Laura Hamilton, professor and chair of sociology at the University of California, Merced. I study how universities support or fail to support economically and racially marginalized populations. I am really deeply committed to this topic because I'm interested in moving past narratives that focused on sort of so-called individual students' deficits and looking and thinking critically about how colleges and universities are better set up to serve some populations and not others. And also thinking about the ways that we unevenly distribute educational resources to marginalized groups and the universities that serve them. So it's a pleasure to be here. Great, thank you. Uh, Michael Collins. Thank you, Will. It's terrific to be here. Uh, my name is Michael Collins. I'm a vice president at JFF, and JFF is a national nonprofit, and we work to transform our nation's education and workforce development system so that we uh, have everyone having the skills and credentials and resources that they need for economic advancement. And this work is really critically important to me, and this topic actually is really critically important to me. I am launching a new body of work um, at JFF that's focused on racial economic advancement and equity. And I think a lot about black learners and workers, and it's really critical that they have access, right, to high quality um, instruction, high quality learning so that they can navigate not just um, kind of post-secondary, but the transition from post-secondary to work. And so this conversation is um, uh, one that I'm very, very interested uh, in having. Thank you for having me. And finally, Jessica Williams. Hi, I'm Dr. Jessica Roland Williams, and I'm the director of Every Learner Everywhere, which is a collaboration of organizations that work together to support um, faculty and institutions as they are um, implementing new technology into their classrooms and using new technology tools to help support student success. And we specifically focus on success for Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and poverty affected students. And so I'm excited to be a part of this conversation because I think as we are kind of moving into this new phase of education where we are leveraging technology more and more and really um, changing the way we think about teaching and learning, um, I, I think it's just so important to, to think about how we may also want to redefine you know, um, what rigor looks like in those contexts. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Dr. Williams. I really appreciate um, that concept of rigor. I, you know, I want to kind of set up what the conversation is going to look like today. So what we're going to do is we'll have a structured conversation for 30 minutes, and then we'll allow 15 minutes of Q&A. And so I'm hoping people will, will begin to use the chat or the question function in your Zoom to drop questions as, as they rise. But uh, you brought up something very interesting, kind of this concept of rigor. Can we unpack that a little bit and really think about rigor for whom and why that term can sometimes be uh, problematic? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, if we go back kind of to the history, the roots of higher ed, right? Like, you know, higher ed has always been designed um, as a gatekeeper, right? A way to exclude people, a way to let people in and let people out. And I think that, when we think about rigor, um, I think at its, at its face value, rigor has always been important. I think one thing that I'd like for you know us to be able to talk a little bit more about is rigor for whom, right? Like who 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 is on the hook for 
um, delivering um, rigor. But I, but I think that historically we've used that term to um, decide who's in and who's out. And I think that has been problematic because um, one, only certain people have been kind of the gatekeep allowed to even set the standards for who's in and who's out, right? And, and that's problematic for a number of reasons. And, and also I think, you know, like I said, rigor has been leveraged historically to be exclusionary, right? And I think we have an opportunity now to really redefine how we think about rigor um, and how we can leverage it to, um, to bring more people in and to hold ourselves accountable for how we serve students as opposed to keeping students out of higher education. We know that access to resources uh, on this topic is critical. And, and President Bastian, I don't know if you want to address that concept of rigor as someone who makes institutional decisions on who gets what resources or what services get implemented. Certainly, we have been very rigorous in terms of trying to tell people what our standards of expectation for students. We have not been rigorous enough in what expectations and standards we should have for institutions and how investments need to be made and how students don't come to college, as an example, to major in bureaucracy. Yet so many of our institutions uh, take pride in the fact that we have so many rules and regulations and systems and that we then say because of our kind of bad behaviors, well, they're going to have to navigate the complexities of other systems, you know, and so it's good for them to learn here. No, they are going to then have to go to someplace else and learn a whole bunch of bureaucracy. What we need to be saying is what are the intended opportunities? What are the ways in which we are being rigorous about how we utilize our resources to effectively ensure that access and opportunity translates into supports and structures to get people to the finish line and beyond? Dr. Hamilton, I don't know if you want to add anything to this. Yeah, sure. I just want to add to that this is sort of a, a political set of decisions about how, how we allocate resources. As several folks have mentioned, we're talking, you know, when I think about rigor, I think about what institutions can do for students. And one of the things that I look at in my research is the ways in which basically governmental support for higher education was pulled out just as racially marginalized students gain greater access to research universities. And I think about that a lot in terms of the ability of schools to provide rigorous supports for their students. There's a lot of unevenness in the higher education system Students are racially segregated in different types of universities and the way in which we distribute our resources at the state and at the federal level to universities that are doing the work of serving those students makes it really hard for us to provide the kind of supports that students need. And so I just wanted to add that in there that this is also sort of a political larger conversation about directing resources to where they need to go. And I think that's a really interesting point that, you know, we recognize that as demographic has have changed, that maybe funding has gone down um, and that the classroom, uh, as the classroom has become more diverse, um, we should really begin to be, begin thinking about what best practices um, faculty should employ to ensure that all students are engaged and willing or, or able and have the resources they need to to do the, the hard work of learning in person or online. So what are the best practices? What are the practices that faculty should be engaging in as we think about um, you know, providing students with the educational, um, the educational experience that they showed up to college for? I'm happy to take that. <laughs> I'm a, a chair of a sociology department and you know, in charge of the, the curriculum for, for, for that. Faculty really need to relearn uh, the material. Many of us had very limited training in the sense that um, knowledge from marginalized communities uh, was not acknowledged, um, that you know, where ideas originated was not acknowledged. For, for instance, in sociology, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois 
was not part of my training. He's a black scholar whose ideas were absolutely central <laughs> to sociology, um, but often his ideas were attributed to others. I had to do relearning in order to offer his theoretical contributions to my students and to incorporate some of the data visualizations that he used like well over a hundred years ago. Um, so I wanna emphasize that faculty need to do some work um, because a lot of the training we received um, did not validate, uh, acknowledge, um, and sometimes systematically excluded knowledge for, from groups, um, Latinx, indigenous, black groups in particular, and that we need to um, relearn in order to bring that knowledge to our students and, and to help students see themselves in, in our curriculum. And just from an institutional leadership perspective, we've got to provide the professional development dollars and support to make it happen because you can't teach what you don't know. And you can't expect people to engage in sort of inclusive uh, curriculum development and uh, inclusive teaching and equitable teaching and classroom strategies. And then you don't provide them the space and the opportunity to learn the skill sets and to develop that sort of momentum to do it well. And you also have to give students a voice. You know, when we had a, a conversation, I had a conversation with students, you know, in a virtual platform for the campus, faculty could hear, wow, we never had a faculty member that looked like us teach us. We don't see ourselves represented in some of the coursework and materials. And when faculty heard that from the voice of students, many of them said, hey, in my English curriculum, I could add more uh, authors of color. In my you know, theater arts curriculum, I could actually have plays that represent a more diverse set of values and not just our traditional quote unquote classics in the old fashion way. So we've got to be as institutions committed to the resources to support the faculty in their development. I just want to double click on Michael's point about student voice um, at the institutional level, but also at the course level, right? There are opportunities for faculty to reach out directly to students to get feedback, surveys, you know, um, about the course, how the course is going, what's working well, what's not going well. Um, and that's another great place to start to get some of the feedback that's necessary for, for change. Michael? I was just gonna just observe, you know, like and, and appropriately the folks that are closer to uh, um, colleges and in and, and classrooms, um, certainly appropriate, but just kind of from my, my vantage point, thinking about kind of the connection to kind of post-secondary and work, I also um, kind of just observe kind of the, you know, kind of the, the false separation, right, of learners and workers, right? Like, so learners are workers and workers are learners. And so in terms of, you know, kind of um, faculty resources and, and um, you know, kind of what faculty might be thinking about, it really is this, you know, kind of connection between kind of education and work, right? So knowledge for knowledge sake for some learners is, you know, it's necessary, but not sufficient, right? They're, they're, they're trying through their post-secondary experience to make their way through the world, to make their way, you know, through the labor market. And so kind of that relevance piece and really just acknowledging it's not just supply, right? It's not just what the college is doing. It's not just the content. It is, it is also, you know, kind of what um, uh, relevance that content is going to have for somebody who is trying to um, do more than just learn, right? And that's just a, kind of a reality that I think um, is really important and historically, you know, we can really care about our content areas and our disciplines, right? And that's not the world that students experience, right? They don't go out uh, into the workplace and experience a single discipline, right? It is multidisciplinary and, um, and it has to be relevant, right? So, so that's just another kind of observation that I would share to the great um, kind of con um, context you just got from the other panelists. I think these are all great points, but how, how can we encourage faculty to reflect and re-examine teaching strategies, pedagogy, techniques to better meet the needs of today's students and then to connect them with the technologies that are critical to success, um, not only in the classroom, but uh, beyond the classroom. I think we can't start with the premise that people don't want to learn and grow and change. 
You know, I think that sometimes we make a, a, a sort of a decision that faculty don't want to learn or faculty don't want to, you know, be stretched and grow that institutions are not learners. You know, if we learn nothing else from this pandemic, the institution become became a learner. Everybody became a learner. You know, if you were a person that was a face to face instructor and you had to shift on a dime to now go into a virtual environment and learn, you learned it. And so this idea that, you know, there is a faculty that is inflexible and we really can't uh, get them to do this or that. I think that's a fallacy. I think you've got to create the conditions that people can then get in. You can't say, hey, let's become more technological and then don't put the technology, make the, technolo uh, the technological advances available to the faculty, the staff and the students. Uh, so I think that, you know, we've got to start to kind of uh, take down some of the myths and the mythology uh, that exist uh, that ultimately sometimes makes a disconnect between opportunities and conditions that can change our institutional outlook. I'd like to just add in there too, you know, that faculty are just not incentivized to engage in pedagogy to care about students, particularly um, the more the more that research is part of their job, the more that that seems to eclipse everything else, which is high, you know, kind of wild to me because I often think that research and pedagogy go together quite nicely. Um, our students can be part of our research. Um, and they can, you know, really escalate it and make it stronger. But universities are going to need to incentivize teaching and investments in curriculum and pedagogy, um, which means, you know, doing things like not relying on student evaluations, which we already know are, are highly problematic, racialized, gendered. Um, they penalize certain folks and asking people to actually, um, you know, take some take some ped pedagogical training um, to you know show that they've revamped their syllabus to do things like that and have it be um, rewarded um, so that people can advance up through through the ranks in part by demonstrating excellence in teaching which just doesn't happen right now right now it's sort of a the, the last least important thing for faculty. Um, so I really want to emphasize the need for, for that to be built into excellence for institutions to assess that um, as part of that. Dr. Hamilton, can I um, just plus one on that and just to kind of add like around the incentives, you know, I would also love to see kind of incentives for um, collaboration across disciplines. You know, as we look at kind of what it takes to be successful in the labor market, we know that, you know, you know, kind of deep, deep knowledge in one area, right, like is a high risk in an economy, right, with frequent disruptions and people who have a sense of multidisciplinary, you know, uh, perspectives and approaches in some ways are more resilient, right, in, in, in a kind of turbulent economy with frequent changes. And so more collaboration kind of across disciplines more incentives for faculty in disciplines to actually engage, you know, whether it be the people that think about digital, like Dr. Bastin, you, you mentioned, you know, kind of the quick shift to um, kind of uh, online learning when the pandemic happened and the rush to do that, you know, but there are major implications for, you know, students who are studying, you know, humanities and liberal arts to have, you know, kind of strong digital skills and competencies. And so where are the incentives for those kinds of collaborations? Again, my angle being kind of, you know, leveraging high quality learning, rigorous learning to advance, not just in post-secondary, but also after post-secondary. I love that because in fact, we, we need to highlight the skills. We got to start highlighting skills as well. The fact is the students someday want to uh, be in robust careers that take care of themselves and their families and others. And, you know, the conversation of skill is often like, oh, well, you'll learn that stuff later. Or, oh, it's, you know, it can't be disconnected from the fact that people want to ultimately get into a career and make a living and have a life. And it's not, you know, I think that that practical part of the conversation has to be embedded in the conversation. I think one, one last thing I want to add to this is just the power and the importance of peer-to-peer -peer learning. That's something that we're finding. Um, a lot of times, you know, faculty 
you know, need their, their community. And I think throughout the pandemic, that's something that we've lost a lot of. And, you know, a lot of faculty within discipline, outside of di discipline have made up significant progress in, in a lot of these different areas. And I think the more we can encourage faculty to talk to each other and learn from each other um, and share resources and share tips and tricks and share tools, um, then I think that that makes innovation um, easier. Michael, what are the workforce implications if we don't get this right? You know, that's a, that's a great question. I think a lot about that. And, you know, the ultimately, you know, the if we don't, if we're not able to offer, you know, kind of inclusive and rigorous, you know, kind of um, post-secondary experiences, we're going to essentially ex exacerbate kind of the racial inequality, right? Um, the economic inequality that we see today, right? 50% of U.S. kind of uh, uh, workers right now are in harm's way of um, disruption by technology, right? Uh, we know that high quality higher education, um, you know, kind of can position people to um, be prepared to work with uh, technology, AI and intelligent machines, right? Uh, being able to think critically, being able to um, kind of problem solve all of the things that high quality higher education does is so critically uh, needed. And we're finding that, um, you know, kind of black, Latinx and indigenous populations, you know, are often not, not getting that kind of high quality, um, you know, kind of uh, educational experience. And, um, you know, when we look at the, who is where in the labor market right now, we see that, you know, people who aren't able to access some of the high quality learning experiences, um, you know, uh, are finding themselves in fields, right, that are associated with low wages, you know, um, Black and Latinx uh, workers are much more likely to be um, working low low wage jobs, right? They are concentrated in um, low wage kind of healthcare jobs, retail, food service, right? And so, high quality learning experiences can help disrupt some of this and um, make them more. Um, I, I don't want to say resilient because they are resilient, but can give them. Uh, greater opportunities. Of course, we also have to acknowledge kind of, you know, uh, kind of racism and bias in hiring, but, uh, you know, without high quality, rigorous learning opportunities, um, you know, they're at a disadvantage. And, and frankly, ultimately, we will see the wealth gap, right, increase. And for, for Black people, right, like there's already a one to 10, you know, um, you know, white families have 10 times more, you um, uh, wealth than, than, and then black families. And so if we don't get this right and make higher education, um, kind of inclusive, rigorous and high quality, um, you know, we are looking at a, a, a very, um, um, bleak future, but we're going to get it right. So I don't want to leave us on a negative note. We're going to figure this out. That's the purpose of this conversation today. I want to try and and get a couple more questions in before we transition to some questions that are coming in from the audience. What, what did we learn from COVID, either positive or negative, and what do we need to do to improve uh, or to get remote slash online instruction right? Certainly, the, uh, we, have excuse, we have abused excuses for far too long. So we have always talked about what we can't do. And, and how the rules are set up and we can't deviate from them. And we, we have to have this many, uh, this many weeks and we have to have this hour. This is, has to be the time frame of the class. And we can't, well, people won't take classes virtually and people won't. So all the excuses that we have made, we have abused about what our limitations are, how we're handcuffed to certain structures and this is the way it is. You know, I think we hopefully will overcome that abuse of excuse and start to recognize that the same kind of flexibility and agility that we engaged in throughout this difficult time should be translated into specific steps that we can take to continue to grow and to move our institutions and, and the whole work of higher education forward. So I hope, uh, to your point, your question, you know, that we will get a hold of the uh, abuse uh, of excuse. Dr. Williams, I saw you wanted to jump in. Um, I, one thing I was surprised to learn through this is that um, our students really appreciate online learning. They appreciate the flexibility 
Um, I think, you know, we've always thought like, oh, you know, we don't, we got to get back in the classroom. And I think, you know, I, I think for some students, the classroom is a better in learning environment for, but I was surprised to learn, you know, through a number of different reports that for many marginalized students, um, many students, you know, who have jobs and who have families and other types of commitments, online learning provides them flexibility that allows them to stay engaged in ways that they otherwise wouldn't. And so I think knowing that, right, then we, we can't just say we got to get back in the classroom, got to get back in the classroom, and then that's it. You know, I think we do have to create multiple modalities of educating students because that's going to be necessary to make sure that we're truly providing, you know, equitable learning experiences for all learners going forward. I, I'm happy to jump in too. Um, you know, I, I I do a lot of research on online education, and I, I do have a lot of concerns about moving moving online. And I worry that this moment will will lead u- universities to do that because they perceive it to be cheaper. But I will say that um, I think I learned, and we all learned a few things about how we can bring technology into our classrooms and the ways in which our actual in person classrooms can change. Um, to create greater engagement with our student population. So for for a simple example of this, my students taught me how to run a Slack channel. Um, And I'm now thinking that one should run a Slack channel while actually in person in the classroom. Because the thing I learned was that some students who won't speak up in person in a space that feels really intimidating um, in front of their peers will will chat on um, a forum like Slack um, and raise questions and ask things that they wouldn't have done in person. And so that got me thinking about what are some of the things that I did like that could be better incorporated into the classroom um, and that you know, the classroom should be, should be changing in ways to reflect um, you know, the ways that our, our students are interacting with each other. Um, and that you know, the, you know, the lecture hall <laughs> where we sit there and just deliver content is, is problematic. We've known that for a long time, but we should try to incorporate some of the things that we learned over the course of the past year to make the in-person experience better. Well, I know. Yeah, I know we need to move on, but just I can't I can't help but saying this. One of the things with um, regard to rigor and uh, Dr. Williams was talking about kind of rigor being used to kind of exclude. One of the things that we learned in the pandemic um, is that, you know, kind of rigor in terms of, you know, kind of uh, meeting certain bars and standardized tests, you know, for some of these elite universities, like all of a sudden went out the window. Right. They right. Like so they weren't like they were so relevant and they're so rigorous, you know, and we you know couldn't live without them. But all of a sudden we don't need them anymore. Right. So huge signals right around Dr. Williams's point around like when we're talking about rigor and these high bars, like what are we really talking about? And like acknowledging per, you know, Dr. Hamilton's comment, the politics of some of this. And, you know, there is some dog whistling around rigor. So like just being careful there. The second, you know, kind of observation that I would share about what we learned, and it's a blend of, you know, kind of Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Williams's points. I think that the hybrid is kind of the new normal, right? Like um, bricks and mortar has its, has its place. But I think that online has its place. I think it's a huge lesson. We, um, we, I think, are in kind of um, the, the the next era is going to be how do we how do we have high quality higher education that is hybrid. Some is going to be in in classrooms and some is going to be online. And so it's really critical the the rigor piece and inclusivity piece really becomes important from where I'm sitting because you know kind of black learners and workers, Latinx, Indigenous, you know. You're, they're going to need high quality learning experiences, right? As they are trying to navigate kind of work and family, right? And not just point in time, like when they get a credential, it's lifelong learning is required. So how do we do this to get that first credential, but then the subsequent credentials or the subsequent skills? And so I think that that's kind of the new normal and that's a big lesson from this pandemic. So um, what, one last question, are there any examples of faculty or institutions getting this right? Do we have any bright spots to offer folks of examples they should be looking at before we take, uh, begin taking questions? I'd like to talk about Posse. Um, I don't know if everyone's <laughs> familiar with Posse and I think there's some, some, some lessons to be learned. So Posse brings in a network of students 
together um, who often may not have qualified according to some of the, the standards we were talking about earlier using the SAT or whatever for a particular institution, usually a pretty high status institution. And the, the part where students come together is really, really important because a lot of times marginalized students when they enter elite environments are one or one of a handful of students and they don't have a network, they don't have a peer support, they don't have a community. And so Posse brings in a group. Um, these students do extremely well. A lot of times they end up being um, the top of the class, valedictorian um, at graduation and sort of prove, prove the point that um, our rigorous institutions often exclude groups that can exceed, you know, all students' expectations, be at the top of their class when they have supports. And the, the kind of support that I'm talking about here is having other people that, that um, share your life experiences so that you're not the only one um, in a hostile environment that doesn't understand who you are. And also um, the institution tends to provide a lot of um, sort of uh, financial support to the students and there's a lot of programming that goes around that. But I think we can see here that that, that is a small model of something that can be done on, on the larger scale to, to support students that, that works. I'd like to just uh, show. I was going to give a shout out uh, really uh, quickly to, um, I, I'm always inspired by the work that um, uh, Paul Quinn College is doing. It's an HBCU in Dallas, and it's a federally designated work college. And every student there um, is essentially required to work. And so the, you know, kind of that high quality learning connected to work, uh, the, the, the students are also, um, they are required to earn industry-based credentials, and so I love the, you know, and Michael Sorrell, the president, um, you know, is he's just a visionary. And I love the embrace of both the kind of academic content. They're helping the, the young people, you know, be successful there, but also intentionally helping them translate those high quality learning experiences into kind of, um, you know, kind of successful transitions into the economy. So I think, you know, Paul Quinn um, is doing, doing a great job. And I just want to shout out all of the colleges that are engaged in guided pathways. The idea that we are going to have clearly designed educational opportunities that are connected to career opportunities and exploration that have strong connections tying in on the front end, the K-12 system with the uh, two and four-year systems, and then those business opportunities, business and industries on the back end, those institutions that have provided that intense, intrusive advising and that help of the student so that the student identity is also developed so that that sense of belonging is real. I'd like to plus one all of those institutions that are engaged in that way. Yeah, plus one on that, Michael. Um, I want to jump uh, to questions from the audience quick. Uh, there, there's this concept of rigor has come up uh, again and again. And one of the questions that was in the chat was around um, uh, the concept of, uh, isn't the concept of rigor um, really um, uh, uh, the assumption that students are learning from a co common body of knowledge? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and, and uh, address uh, this question or comment from, uh, from, uh, from one of the members of the audience. So I think yes, but I think where it can get complicated is how students demonstrate mastery of that knowledge. Like there's a lot of, um, you know, because yes, students are learning from a co common knowledge of, you know, body of knowledge. And yes, we do want students to learn certain things. Um, but right, um, you know, who gets to decide what those things are? Who gets to decide, you know, how we know once the students know those things? You know, I think we, we have to go back and evaluate um, how we're like how we're coming to conclusions about what students know and what students don't know, and then what we're doing with that information, right? So, if students have not reached mastery, or if students have not, you know, then what does that mean for the student? What does that mean for the institution? You know, I think historically we've used this information to conclude that these students don't make the cut, right? And we've never really flipped that and said maybe that means that the institution hasn't served the student well, right? And so I just Again, it comes back to our original point is when we're talking about rigor, you know, rigor for whom and what are we doing with that information? 
Can I just piggyback on that? Because I 100%, Dr. Williams, and, you know, I think about kind of the example of mathematics, right? Like, so in some of the um, guided pathways work that Dr. Baston, you know, talked, talked about, um, you know, kind of this sense that, you know, kind of college algebra was needed for all pathways, right? And so the mathematics community, you know, kind of got together, AMATIC and others, and, you know, determined that for some pathways, you know, algebra was not kind of the, you know, kind of the essentially the gatekeeper. And so there was all this rigor around what math, you know, kind of course or standard was needed. And, and to be really honest, many students like stopped at lot lost out right before we, you know, began to think about, you know, kind of statistics or quantitative reasoning, you know, or appropriate courses for certain pathways, you know, we lost a lot of students. So like, people were standing on what they thought was rigor and what they thought was needed. And in fact, you know, there was evidence that that wasn't the case. So really kind of rethinking, you know, it's like, what do students need and what do they need now? And, and making sure that we're grounding kind of, you know, curriculum in what is needed uh, now. And one of the things we don't need is remedial education. And so if you're still operating remedial education that requires students to take coursework that is not, that does not, for college credit, then you should look into how you need to, you should maybe implement a co-requisite model or a model that uh, uses multiple measures to see if students are ready for a college level math course. I'm sorry, Dr. Hamilton, is there anything you wanted to add on that topic? I was actually gonna say that, but um, agree 100%. I also agree with the earlier comments. Um, you know, there's, I think we need to think about how we're doing things. And, you know, um, we, we heard that a few seconds ago from Dr. Williams. Um, I, you know, I often, we teach statistics in, in sociology and there's, there's a couple ways to do it. One way is to like throw abstract math models and mathematic formula at people. Um, another way to do it is to um, give people a real life challenge and have them walk through it um, with a series of, uh, you know, with a, a program to help you, you know, use data and say, we're telling a story. Let's figure out if we can, you know, figure out how to tell that story and how do, how do we marshal data to do that? And that's, that's a lot, that's a lot more accessible um, for certain folks. And, you know, those individuals who learn that training can go on to use those skills in the workforce in a way that's much more meaningful than using the abstract mathematical um, language, right? So I, I think the how we're doing things is important. And you can do both, both of those things so that you, you know, you reach all student audiences. Um, but the how is really, really central here um, and not putting up a barrier that's gonna exclude folks. Some students who cannot pass algebra then become, and you know, we got rid of that requirement um, to, to that other point in our program. They go on to be some of our best statistics students with the strongest projects who go on to industry and do really well and grad school. So, yeah. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in uh, before we, or, or if we should take another question. If not, I'll jump right into the next question. As a director of a pool of over 700 adjunct faculty, what resources uh, do you recommend for my office to begin professional training to cover the topic of inclusivity and access? Is there a good primer out there? Wonderful question. You know, we have just created an adjunct academy at Rockland Community College. So we are actually investing resources to help our adjuncts not only develop their powerful teaching skills and, and, and how to navigate the classroom experience and how to work with students of different backgrounds, but also for those who want to be on a full-time uh, track to become a full-time professor or if they wanna go into administration so that they have the kinds of practical experiences so that they can be even more effective in their craft. We have to make investments. If we want to see different results, we have to be willing to make the investments. And I think that what has happened oftentimes is that, you know, we, we kind of like sort of pull people in and we give them a, a, a seminar or one little uh, video and we say, okay, well, that's the investment. Or you say, hey, click and go if you want to, and it's here. You know, the fact that you put it on your website and say it's here for you, is not an investment. It's not the level of intentionality. And so as educational leaders, we have to be willing to make the appropriate investments and lean in if we really want to have better outcomes for our institutions. 
Um, in terms of a primer, I can't think of a specific thing, but I, I do want to emphasize if you're, you know, you have these people who are learning to stay away from models um, that focus on individual differences and identities and sort of level the playing field so that like playing the tuba is the same thing as being from an economically marginalized background is the same thing as um, I think what you want is to have a curriculum that focuses on understanding historical systems of oppression and how they work over time um, to create disparities that are structurally based in our political systems and our legal systems and our educational systems. And so I would lean toward that kind of primer and away from things that focus on, that try to keep things on an individual difference level. I'll, uh, I'll put in maybe the final qu question. Uh, and this is uh, uh, one of the, the participants says, I believe in DEI, but don't have time to add material to my class. How do you suggest we go about the work of helping the faculty strategically commit to DEI and student success as worthwhile endeavors and don't detract from the curriculum, but rather enhance it? I'm happy to talk again. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to take up all the time. Um, I would encourage faculty to, to, to recognize that this work also benefits their research. So one of the, you know, a lot of the ways students and advice faculty is to tell them that they're going to do better research if they can recognize, for example, um, knowledge that um, is often hidden or um, not, um, not recognized. Um, and, and at least in sociology, it's very true that you will do better research um, if you invest in DEI, um, because you're going to have exposure to a variety of very important and critical um, ideas. And that then feeds into the classroom. So it doesn't always have to start with the classroom. One way to do it is to encourage folks to do this as like a broader challenge to how they how they go about everything they're doing, it, their research, also their service, like thinking about how, um, you know, particularly there was another comment here about, you know, we're all white cisgender heterosexual faculty. And I'm like, well, you're particularly exactly the folks who should be doing this perfect, right? Because a lot of times this is work that falls on scholars of color um, and white folks are just waiting around for one of those people to like stumble into their department, right? And, and that, that does not work. You know, these are exactly the people that should be doing it and who are gonna benefit in all aspects of what they do. And now I'll be quiet. I just want to jump in here too. I was trying to kind of like not want to be like Laura, like where you at as well. Because at the end of the day, it can't just be the faculty person. It can't just be one class. Your institution has to make a commitment to inclusive excellence. Inclusive excellence has to be permeated throughout the institution. It cannot just be on the backs of faculty. It's got to be everywhere and in every way. It's got to be communicated from the top of the organization and all the way through. And it's how you engage in the student experience and the critical junctures of that experience and the equitable plans that you have in place because of the systems in that experience, as well as the employees employee experience. We've been very focused on the employee experience. We look at candidacy. Who are we hiring? How diverse are those pools? And not just experience and not, but all of that. You know, how are we making sure that people succeed in their first year? How are we making sure that they're getting the great professional development and having an opportunity to leave a positive legacy? So in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and those topics and conversations, we all have to be committed as an institution to do our individual part to support the collective vision of inclusive excellence. And it can't just be, well, it's every individual faculty member's responsibility to learn all they can and now incorporate everything and so on and so forth. So that commitment has to be significant, substantial, and permeated. And I'll just use this as Dr. an Dr. Williams, are you gonna add any last words? Yeah, just that? a last thing, just an opportunity for a shameless plug for a resource that we just released. Um, we get this question all the time, so much so that we, recently released a, a guide called Getting Started with Equity because, you know, folks are saying, how do I get started, right? And, it, and it's at the departmental chair level. And there are also research briefs. I put it in the chat. There are also research uh, briefs that are discipline specific. We had faculty to write 
um, briefs, discipline specific briefs to give you some tips about, you know, how to embed equity in a biology course, for example, or a math course, for example, or an English course, for example, because we realize that, you know, equity is, you know, like when you're thinking about these things, like it's, it's different for different contexts. Um, so that would be a great place to start. And I think there are another great resources. And I just want to echo everyone's sentiment, like equity is not the sideshow, right? Like this is the work. This is the work. This isn't tangential to the work. This isn't a distraction from the work. This is the work. On that, we have to end the panel. I want to thank my panelists for uh, such a great and engaging conversation. There are some chats that have been, uh, there have been some links dropped in the chat. I hope folks get a chance to look at those. And I want to thank everyone for making time today and having this conversation with us on inclusivity access and ensuring that we are uh, providing students with the educational resources and educational experiences that best serves them. So thanks everyone.